Tourette's podcast is not a medical advice show. It's a show about experiences. In the course of that, we may talk about medications or therapies or stories from the doctor's office, but don't mistake any of that for medical advice or direction. It's not. Get that only from people or places licensed or certified to give it. Not from a massively fun and action-packed podcast about our life experiences, such as... OCD, depression, and anxiety. I got all of them. (laughs) I was like, I know that people mean well most of the time, but their unsolicited advice, like when they're like, oh, well, I used to have that too, but I just, every time they came to my head, I just stopped them. I'm like, well, that's not how it works. This is Tourette's Podcast, made possible with support of the Tourette Association of America and part of the Geeks Rising Network. Greetings, everybody. Hello, my name is Ben, and I'm the creator of Tourette's Podcast. Now, right now, starting here in its eighth season, And we really have a treat for you. This is awesome. Uh, Before I go further, let me make one clarification. This is episode one of the new season. And as we always do, we have an episode zero, which catches us up, uh, a separate episode zero. Um, It answers questions about where the podcast has been lately. Lots of good listener Q&A. So you can find episode zero as well. What, What I've done with that is I've taken questions that have come in more than once and made an episode out of answering them. So that's episode zero of season eight, released concurrently with this episode one. You can find them both at Tourette'sPodcast.com. Tourette's Podcast has grown a lot since season one, not just an audience and frame of reference, but in vision. And part of that is I don't want it to be me all the time. I don't want it to be my voice asking all the questions and, and maybe directing the conversation. I wanted to diversify the voices here, including on the hosting duties, because I have my frame of reference and other people have theirs. And through that, Other people will have their own style of interviewing or carrying conversation or questions they prefer to ask. And so I wanted to work with that and bring on guest hosts for some of the episodes of this season. And I'm so glad we're doing that because the conversations we've recorded so far have been so excellent and different and refreshing for the podcast, honestly. So again, it's not just me and my perspective. We're welcoming other interviewers in and we're going to start off this season with a voice that most of you, many of you, a lot of you at least know very well. And that's Brittany Wolf. She'll be your host on this episode, and she carries it in such a good direction with our first guest, Aya. They have a great conversation. Aya was diagnosed with Tourette syndrome last year when she was 16, but she knows she's always lived with it. It's just that it became more noticeable as the years progressed, and then there's what she called a tick boom that she experienced. Brittany and Aya talk about school, how teachers should maybe think about Tourette syndrome when there are clear potential difficulties in the learning environment when you have tics or other co-occurring conditions, which they also talk about, like OCD and anxiety, and the importance of seeing yourself represented in the advocacy that you see out there, which can really save lives. One thing they don't go too much into here, and I'd like to mention, is that Brittany Wolf recently released a book. It's called Ticking My Way Through Life. I've read the whole thing. It's awesome. It's where she looks at how Tourette has followed her through life and how she's dealt with it. And it has all these parts that I think are really beneficial to parents and teachers, not to mention all the relatable stuff she writes about in her own life. So that's Ticking My Way Through Life, the book by Brittany Wolf, and I'll link to it where you can buy it in the show notes with this episode at Tourette'sPodcast.com. And let's get to it. I'll be quiet now, and I'm going to play this interview recorded a short time ago with Brittany and Aya. Hi, everyone. I am Brittany Wolf. I am guest hosting here on Tourette Podcast. Ben was kind enough to let me take the reins on this one, and I am so excited to be doing this. I love this podcast. I was lucky enough to be a guest on this podcast in its first season, so I'm super pumped to be talking to somebody else with Tourette Syndrome and taking that hosting position for just this episode. Today, I am talking to Aya, and I am super excited to be talking to her as well. Aya, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for being here. Hi, thanks for having me here. Um, I'm yeah. super excited for this opportunity because I've been like listening to the podcast for like forever. <laughs> and I don't know, I think it's a really cool opportunity, and I'm like super excited, super stoked. Absolutely. Completely agree. This podcast is really important, in my opinion, and what it's doing and sharing everybody's stories. And podcasts are like what everybody listens to these days, myself included. So it's the 
it's the perfect thing, I think. Yeah, definitely. All right. So, well, I'm just going to go ahead and jump in uh, into it. Uh, I always kind of like to start. So when I do my uh, interviews, when I do YouTube videos, I always start with what age were you diagnosed with Tourette's syndrome? And then how old are you now? Um, I was actually diagnosed when I was 16 and I'm 17 now. So that happened last year, but I've had it all my life. Uh, we just never really looked into it, you know, cause we didn't really know what it was and it wasn't, it wasn't super noticeable until about like two years ago. Um, that's when I started having like, uh, a lot more, uh, vocal tics and more noticeable motor tics. Like obviously like the head jerking, like that one is like super noticeable. Like that's the first one I noticed. Like I remember, I remember it like it was yesterday. I was sitting in my room and um, like all of a sudden I just like got this weird, like this like feeling like I was like, I need to move my head. Like I need to like jerk it like to the left. And I was like, whoa, what the heck is going on? And so I did it. And then after I did it the first time, it's like I couldn't stop doing it. And I told my parents right away. I was like, hey, um, I don't know what's going on. I think I might have like strained a muscle and it's just like twitching or something like I didn't, I had no clue what was going on. Like, it was really scary for me. Um, but like, after that, the ticks kind of like progressed. Like, it was kind of what I would say uh, is like a tick boom. Like, everything just kind of exploded, like, with my ticks. Um, and that's how it like led up to the diagnosis. Basically, that like boom of like ticks led up to my diagnosis because before then, they weren't noticeable enough. Like, um, I remember being in elementary school and doing little things. Like I would like roll my eyes or like make funny faces sometimes. And like, I would get sent to like stand in the corner of my, my, uh, my classrooms, like when I was in school (laughs) and I was like, I had no clue what I was doing. I just thought I was like in trouble for like something else. Like I didn't know I had done anything. Um, it, but like they weren't noticeable to me or to anybody else. Like they were just seen as like bad behavior and stuff, you know? Yeah. That's so really yeah. interesting. Yeah. So I got diagnosed in December of 2021. Okay. So pretty, pretty recently. Yeah. Very recent. <laughs> so was that it happening so much later? Did it make it any harder to, you know, accept that diagnosis? Was it more of like a relief when you had an answer for it? I feel like it was definitely more of a relief um, because I finally knew what was going on. I had an explanation for things over the years that had happened to me that like didn't really make sense at the time, but now made sense because of the diagnosis. So it was like, it was kind of comforting to like have, like, just know, Hey, I have Tourette syndrome. Like, this is what's going on. This is what, this is something I have. This is part of me now. Like, well, it's always been part of me, but it's like I have a name for it. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, absolutely. And that's what I hear a lot, especially when it's a later diagnosis, when it's been something that, you know, the person has felt or has known like something's happening, but don't they don't have an answer for it. And so I can definitely understand that being a more of a sigh of relief or rather than, I mean, it's not necessarily always like obviously the easiest to Um, except knowing that it'll probably be happening forever, but just have an answer for all of these things. And when you were talking about the first time you noticed your tics, it's really crazy because your story resonated with me so much because I also remember like it was yesterday, the very first time that I ever ticked and the same exact thing. I just had this feeling like, and the weirdest thing is that I knew like what body part I had to move, but I didn't know why my body was making me do it. Yeah. It's it's honestly the strangest feeling that like urge before you have to take. Like trying to describe it to people like uh I've had people mainly at school and stuff because that's where I am most of the time uh who will, like ask me like so what's it like? What what does it feel like? And I'm like I don't know how to describe it quite exactly. I usually say um it's something like like an itch cuz that's mm-hmm. what like some motor tics feel like. Um like I have a really bad tick where I just flip people off all the time. 
<laughs> but I feel like this like tingly sensation and it's kind of itchy. So I, I just say it's like an itch kind of. And like doing the tick, doing that motion, like gets the itch away, like it scratches the itch. So that's how I'd usually describe it. But yeah, it's think- it's honestly the weirdest thing. I think that's a really good description because it is that itch because especially like if you were to think about it in re- uh in regards to like an itch from almost like a bug bite or something because it will it will scratch that itch but then it comes back. Yeah, yeah. And it's it like always- a never never ending itch. <laughs> yeah, I would say that that's absolutely accurate. A never ending itch I think would be a perfect description for it. <laughs> I am- I like to sometimes say it's hiccups because, but I like the itch better only because of like the urgency sometimes that are with those itches. But I yeah. like the hiccup analogy. I only like to use that because it's like you never necessarily know when it's going to happen. And you also never know when the hiccups are going to stop, at least for me. Yeah. And so there's like remedies that people can do, but like you never know if any one of them is going to actually work. Like holding your breath, sometimes it works, but the next day it doesn't work. My uh, my school nurse actually uh, says she punches her kids in the stomach to make their tickets, their uh, hiccups go away. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't. I'm not quite sure about that one. I've never heard of that, but she says it works, so I trust her. <laughs> All right, we'll just we'll just go with that. I think I'm gonna try the other options for myself personally. <laughs> but you know, whatever works for people. Yeah. Um, so what were some of the, so you said that when you were in school, you started getting, you know, punished essentially, and you didn't even realize what you were being punished for, which had to be so confusing and so unnerving. Were there any ticks that besides that head tilting tick that you specifically noticed that your family or anybody noticed like that started happening? Um, definitely. I had this one where I would make kind of like the popping sound with my mouth, like the like oh, yeah. that and um that one I've done that since like elementary school um and uh, my family they just thought I did it because I liked making noise <laughs> <laughs> because I was an overactive kid um but uh no that was Tourette's apparently um and I noticed it but I didn't really think much of it I just was like hey this is something that I feel like I need to do so I just do it yeah. Yeah. So it, it felt kind of natural to me. Like, and as, as a kid, you don't get that, hey, this isn't something that's normal. This is something I should probably get checked out. You're just like, oh, this is just something I'm doing. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. I was actually just talking to two people the other, a couple of days ago and he made a really, one of the guys, he made a really good comment saying like, you don't really know what not like what not normal is until you realize like you're around other people that don't do these things. Yeah, exactly. It's weird too. Um, because, uh, have you ever like met up with people who have Tourette's like for a support group or something or like Tourette conference, like anything by like TAA or like anything like that? Uh, for the very first time I was ever around people with Tourette syndrome was actually just last month. I was at the Tourette conference. Really? Yeah. Um, the first time I was around other people with Tourette's was actually a outpatient, um, sm- like mental health support group. Mm. And, um, there were two other like teenagers there, obviously my age, um, who had, uh, uh, one of them had a tick disorder. I'm not sure which, but the other one had Tourette's. And we kind of like bonded over that. And we're like, hey, this is like such a weird coincidence. But I like, it's weird because I finally felt normal in that space. Like, I felt like, yeah, since these other people are ticking and I'm ticking, this is like a normal thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that I remember feeling the exact same way. It was, it was a really cool and awesome feeling to just feel like you didn't have to have eyes on you or feel like you have to suppress or anything like that you could just take as much as your body needed to yeah it it's it's a great feeling yeah but like I would completely agree <laughs> yeah but like I feel like around 
I don't have any friends like in person who have Tourette's. So like at school and stuff, it's like I'm completely alone. And it's like the most isolating thing ever. So when you when you are at school, when you're taking this off, now that you know you have Tourette's syndrome and you have that diagnosis, are teachers are they accommodating? Do they, I hope that they still don't, I know that I've heard stories of this, but I hope that they still don't like punish you for them. Are they like, how are the teachers in school with your tips now? Um, hi. Um, so basically at the beginning of the school year, I did not have my Tourette's diagnosis yet. Um, because it was like August of 2021 and I got my diagnosis in December. Um, So uh, at the beginning of the school year, all of my teachers got an email that said, basically, I have tics. Um, We don't know why, um, but I just do. Um, And so they knew I had tics. So I wasn't getting in trouble, at least, um, which was good. Um, But I did get a few comments um, specifically from my English teacher. Like she would mumble under her breath sometimes like, uh do you really have to whistle right now like stuff oh, like that and gosh. like that uh, it took everything in me not to like cry in class because it's like I don't know it's words are so hurtful and like people just don't realize and yeah. like especially coming from like a person who I'm supposed to like trust like a teacher mm-hmm. like I don't know it hurts a little bit more Absolutely. but um I would- I I agree with that. When I was in middle school, um, this particular teacher didn't know I had Tourette syndrome actually, but it's because he just didn't ever create an environment in which I felt comfortable or safe in telling him that. And it was just an art class, and I was never good at art. So I did, and it was only like through a grading period I would switch over to something else, another elective or whatever. After that, yeah, and he would make us stand around his desk. So that he could tell us the right way to draw, which I always thought was crazy in general. <laughs> um, yeah. Because to me, I thought art was just art. And as long as I was trying, that was okay. <laughs> and I had accepted a long, long before this that art was not my thing. I'm not good at it. It's fine. I, I'm okay with not being good at it. But I was the lucky one that had to stand next to him that day. And he looked up at me and said, would you please sit still? And I just felt like everything inside of me crumbled. Oh my god i and I would not be able to handle that. <laughs> I it took a lot for me to not start bursting into tears at that moment. Like it was that feeling where you could feel the pressure behind your eyes, and like your face gets hot, and you know you're about to cry if you try to say any words out loud. Yeah, so I just put my head down, and my best friend at the time, who knew I had Tourette syndrome put her hand on my back and asked me if I was taking and I just kind of shook my head yes and looked down like I didn't make eye contact with anybody after that and I was too afraid to tell him like hey like no actually actually I can't sit still so I don't know what we're gonna do about that <laughs> <laughs> oh my god I would I I feel like yeah because you said middle school right yep middle school yeah if that was me in middle school I would not have said anything either but like now like I'm at a place where I'm comfortable with my like Tourette's and like as weird as that sounds like being comfortable with your Tourette's is like a big thing mm-hmm. and um I'm comfortable talking about it with people and I'm comfortable with people knowing so like if I need to argue somebody over my Tourette's like I will I 100% will yeah and good for you and that's what that's one of the moments that I always look back on with regret. I'm like, man, I wish I just would have said something. But even in that moment, I was like, even if I tell him, I don't think he's going to believe me. Yeah. So like, it just wasn't worth it to me. I know my mom was very upset when I told her when I got home, but I told her it wasn't worth doing anything about it. And I feel like I didn't know it at the time, but I felt like I was kind of proven right that he wouldn't have believed me. I have a cousin that has a brittle bones disease. So like she couldn't participate like in gym. She had to go to class, but she couldn't participate in any activities because she could trip over something and break a bone. Yeah. And so she was just like keeping score. They must have been playing like kickball or something that day. And she was just keeping score. And the art teacher was just subbing that day or that period and yelled at her for not participating. And when she told him that that's what she had, he didn't believe her. He yelled at her more. 
I guess ignorant people will be ignorant, I guess. Right. And that's the thing, like with teachers, like you said, like it's somebody that you're supposed to feel safe with and that they're supposed to help you in any way that they can and care about all of their students, whether or not that's students that can't sit still or can't not make noises. And it's so, like you said, it just, it sticks with you. And I don't think a lot of teachers out there realize how just those little things stick with you. Like I still remember my story from middle school and you're probably going to remember, if I had to guess, remember that teacher saying things under her breath forever yep. now. Definitely. So are you going into your senior year then? Yes, I'm going into my senior year. So does it make you more hesitant about telling your teachers next year? Does that like does that like play in the back of your mind at all when you're when you think about that? It does a little, but I kind of have to remind myself I'm like, "Hey, not everybody is going to be like that. That's one person." And if you don't tell them, it's probably going to be worse because I'm like remembering things from elementary school. I'm like, if I don't tell them, they're just going to think I'm just being disrespectful and disruptive and all of this stuff. So it's better to just let them know so they at least have a reason. And I mean, what's the worst they can say? Like, you don't have Tourette's? Like, <laughs> <laughs> like I wish I didn't. <laughs> right. So, how do you go about telling your teachers when? you do that is it the email like the email still that gets told to them do you take it upon yourself to just have a, like a conversation with each of your teachers how do you do that so this year i plan on basically uh meeting up with them during open house so like before school starts and like when i meet with them i'm going to tell them i'm going to be like hey i'm going to be in your class this year and i have Tourette syndrome just letting you know here's my name so you can like remember and like stuff like that but then uh when the actual school year starts uh all my teachers like get like a mandatory email from the nurse's office uh that says i have Tourette's anyways that just like states it so they'll know either way um whether i tell them or not um but also i do give talks for my classes so like so all my um peers and like classmates can know so I did that for the first time this year and oh my god it was so nerve-wracking like standing up in front of all of my like classmates and like having to be like hey I have Tourette's like <laughs> <laughs> like it was a good experience and um people were definitely interested and they were asking questions at the end and they were really engaged and they wanted to know more um which I was really happy about because like people don't usually like uh, have that opportunity to like talk with someone who actually has Tourette's. They usually just get all their information like from the media and like stuff like mm -hmm. that. So I'm glad that they got like that, that opportunity and stuff. And um, I feel like they were like, uh, my classmates were like, um, you know, like uh glad that we could like have that talk yeah but um uh and then my teachers asked a couple questions too at the end too because I was just like asking general questions for everybody like I gave my talk I talked about what Tourette's is I talked about my specific takes and my experiences um I talked about things that people can do to like help me out sometimes because I do need a little bit of help sometimes that's um, a really great idea to add in there yeah um, and then I talked about what to do if you see somebody like on the street who's like ticking, um, that you're sure they're ticking and like, make sure not to like stare at them. Don't like make fun of them. Don't copy them. Don't do all this stuff. Mm -hmm. Just like maybe give them a smile, like ask them if they need any help, if they seem to be struggling with a task or like something like just be kind, you know? Um, and then at the end I was like, so does anyone have any questions? And like literally almost everybody asked questions. Like it was so good. Oh, um, that's awesome. Yeah, it was really good. Um, but I ended up doing that after I got my diagnosis. So it was kind of late in the school year. It was like third quarter, like in like second semester. So <laughs> it was kind of awkward. Um, so I like started off the talk. I was like, so you guys may have been wondering why I'm always like making noises and like twitching in the back of the classroom. And here's why. 
<laughs> um, right. So uh, this year I plan on doing it uh, the first week of school. So I'll see how that goes. Um, I'm nervous for it, but like I've already done it once. So I feel like I can do it again. And these are people that I've probably had in my classes from last year. So, yep. That's what I was going to say. Yeah. So for a lot of them, we'll just be kind of repeating it. I think, I think that's incredible. I think that's such a good idea and so amazing that you do it. And I also, I really, really love that not only do you, are you doing this so you can teach your classmates and stuff about you and what your needs might be and how they might, how they can help. But I really, really love that you're putting in there like what to do if you see somebody else with Tourette syndrome. Yeah. And like that's so important and so it can be so powerful because obviously, as you know, the more people that know, the better. So yeah. that way people aren't being mocked and ridiculed and all of these terrible things. Yeah. And um, so for the talk, um, my counselor, my school counselor actually was there and she was like on the side of the room and she was like uh, adding in like a couple things like here and there too. And like one of the things she said that like really like stuck with me was like, now she's not going to be the first person you're going to meet with Tourette's. There are going to be more. So keep this information in mind. And I'm like, yes, this is 100% true. I'm not going to be the first person or the last person you will meet with Tourette's. Like, this information is important. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. I love that they added that in as well, because you never know who you'll come across. It could be years before you come across somebody that you know of again, but doesn't mean that you will be the only person that they ever meet with Tourette's syndrome. Yeah. That's really awesome. I really love that, at least for the majority, like it seems like everyone, the majority of everyone is pretty accepting of it. And I know that makes such a huge, huge difference. Like if you were to give, like if teachers listening like right now, what would like advice or something that you would say to teachers that they should be or can be doing for a student with Tourette syndrome in the classroom? Like what from your perspective would be helpful? From my perspective, um, definitely don't bring attention to their tics, but also don't ignore them. Um, I feel like teachers get that confused a lot of the time because um, at the beginning of the year when they got like that email about my tics, uh, one of the things that was listed was do not bring attention to the tics. But then they kind of like ignored me like ignored the tics completely to the point where if I was having a tick attack in the classroom they wouldn't like help me so it's like there's like a balance between it if you notice somebody's struggling like if your student is like having a hard time with something or like seems to be like not doing great with their Tourette's then just walk up to them ask them if they need any help like just be kind you know The Tourette Association of America is the premier nonprofit working to raise awareness, advance research, and provide ongoing support for those with Tourette syndrome or a tic disorder. With a network of over 130 chapters, support groups, and centers of excellence, the TAA engages with communities across the nation in an effort to provide tools, webinars, workshops, and support for all seeking assistance. As a primary sponsor of Tourette's podcast, the TAA supports authentic conversations showcasing the diverse representation of the Tourette community. To learn more, go to Tourette.org. That's T-O-U-R-E-T-T-E dot org. The Tourette Association of America. Uncontrollable. Unstoppable. And what kind of things helped you? So like now that we're on the topic of school, I want to make sure we can, I can keep <laughs> jumping off of this. What um, did you do that helped you? Like, so if you did find yourself that you're taking a lot in the classroom or in school, like what would you do to kind of pull yourself out of that if you could? Was there anything that you were able to do while you were in the classroom? Um, if, okay. So I had two options. One was go to this place where it's like the counselor's hub which is, it sounds really weird, but it's basically 
the counselor's office, but like this like little sitting area where they have like a bunch of little like couches and chairs and stuff. And it's like really nice and cozy. And you can just like sit in there and like chill out for a couple seconds. Like, um, and I could either go there or I could go to the nurse's office, um, depending on what was going on. So like, um, if it was like too quiet in the classroom and I felt like uncomfortable because I was like making a lot of noise and I didn't want to disrupt other people and it was making me uncomfortable. Um, then I would just go to the counselor's hub and I would just like sit in there and take my, like do my work in there, you know? Yeah. And it was like a nice, like relaxing space to like be alone and let my takes out and like, not be like all like anxious about it um and I can just go whenever I want like I just have to ask the teacher like hey can I go and they they always say yes um and the nurse's office I only go there when I'm having tick attacks so like if I if I'm sitting in class and I start noticing that I'm like ticking a lot more like um usually I'll start having a lot more um vocal tics and um, my motor tics get, like, a lot more, like, violent, as weird as that sounds. Um, like, I'll start, like, banging on tables and, like, hitting myself a lot. Um, I'm like, hey, this is getting a little bit too much. I might be having a tic attack. Um, so I'll just go to the nurse's office and I'll, like, sit on one of the cots and I'll just, like, chill out in there for a second. and. Um, like just let all my ticks out just let the tick attack happen and then I just go back to class so those are my options really is there anything that you try to do to help like redirect your focus well when it's not a tick attack but you're in <laughs> class and you're still ticking well like whatever like obviously one of the teachers Hi. um fidget toys fidget toys helps so much um because they're kind of like something like that like I have a lot of ticks with my hands specifically and so having something for my hands to do that's not ticking that's like redirecting that energy is like really good for me and um it's like it's like getting the energy out but it's not ticking so it feels really good um and I can still like focus and function and do my work and like pay attention in class so yeah. fidget toys are definitely really really good um, and also weirdly chewing gum helps a lot with like vocal tics. Um, I guess it's because it's like s- your mouth is like moving because it's like chewing. So it's like actively doing something and yeah. it's like, it keeps you from having vocal tics. So yeah, those are two things that I do to like help me in class, like stay more like focused and stuff. Yeah. Um, because my tics do get really, really distracting. <laughs> right. Yep. I definitely know how that is. <laughs> um, what would you say is your favorite fidget toy to use when that's happening? Um, probably my Tangle. So they're like uh, these little like, like, you know, like the shape of uh, macaroni noodles. Yeah. It's basically a bunch of that shape, like connected together in this loop. And you can just like twist it and like scrunch it together and like pull it apart and then snap it back together again. And like, it's just like a thing. And it's called a tangle because you can like twist it up and like tangle it up and then like untangle it. And it's like, it's really good. And mine actually has like this like rubber texture on it. Like you can get like a bunch of different ones. Like they come like, you can get them fluffy. You can get them like, just like solid, like, uh, like plastic. Um, you can get them like, different colors like clear and like sparkly and like all these like crazy things like but like uh mine just has like rubber on the outside like these little rubber notches so like it's got like that like a uh, sensory thing um and that actually helps me a lot too because um I have a lot of like uh sensory issues that come along with my Tourette's for some reason and um well with the Tourette's and the ADHD like together and like having something that's a good texture like calms me down weirdly so I don't know it's like my favorite it's really good good 
So you actually mentioned something that I wanted to talk about a little bit. So you said that the Tourette's syndrome with the ADHD, are there any of the other co-occurring conditions that are common with Tourette's syndrome? Uh, is there any other ones that you are dealing with yourself? Uh, yes. OCD, depression, and anxiety. I got all of them. <laughs> <laughs> so how do you, how do you find your way through all of those? Oh my God. It's, it's crazy every day, but, um, I do it, I guess. Um, basically I just, I try to just be positive about my situation, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, and not try to like dwell on, oh, I have so many things wrong with me. I just like focus on, Hey, I may have these things wrong with me, but I can do these things that can help with these things. You know Mm -hmm. what I'm saying? Yeah, for sure. I can like manage it. Yeah. So with your OCD, so I have, uh, I have OCD and anxiety as well. And I noticed that my OCD plays so much into my tics themselves. And I know a lot of other people in the truck community have similar experiences. So like when I tick, I have to tick in certain numbers, but then I also have to tick very specific ways. So I have obviously (laughs) certain tics that I do all the time, but they have to be done in certain ways. And if I don't, my body doesn't do them correctly or I don't do them correctly. So many times that's generally what will lead into my tick attacks. Is that any? that kind of similar for you? Yeah, that's definitely, (laughs) you said that. And I was like, oh yeah, I definitely, (laughs) this, this relates to me. Um, I have my, like my numbers are three and five. So like I'll do certain ticks for some reason in threes, some in fives. I don't know why. Um, but with my like OCD, like in general, um, I usually only do things in fives. So like uh one big thing that I do like a lot is like washing my hands um like I'll wash my hands repetitively um like five times in a row um and then sometimes it's really weird because I have to do it five times and then I'll take a break in between and then I'll do it five times again and then I'll take a break and then I'll do it again so it's like five times but in a group of three like yeah it's, and it's I think- really it's the weirdest thing and I've gone through so many soap bottles. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that's what people, a lot of people don't realize because we're dealing with all these misconceptions already with Tourette's syndrome, but then so many of us also have OCD, which is also mis- so misconstrued and stigmatized as well because people think that it's all it is because even with your hand washing, like it's it's so much, anybody I feel like listening can understand that it's so much more than that Mm -hmm. because it's that pattern and you not being able to do it. And it's stopping you from being able to do other things. Like for me, my biggest part of my OCD is my intrusive thoughts. Like I hate them more than anything. I hate them more than my tics. Like they just, they come and I can't seem to get them out of my head. And I think I just talked about this not that long ago in a video and because everybody's like, Oh, I'm so OCD. And I'm like, no, no, you're not. Ooh, <laughs> so, I hate that. <laughs> um, and so I was talking about my intrusive thoughts and somebody said, I was like, I know that people mean well most of the time, but their unsolicited advice, like when they're like, oh, well, I used to have that too, but I just, every time they came to my head, I just stopped them. I'm like, well, that's not how it works. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If I could just stop them, then I wouldn't have OCD. It's like, with people with Tourette's too, they, uh, I, I saw a video recently of this dude saying, oh, um, if my kid had Tourette's, I would fix him. Like, that's not how that works. It, you can't just stop it. It's, it's, it's a neurological disorder. <laughs> like, I, right. And I, I, don't think know, there's, I don't know how to explain it to be, people. Right. And I think there's something to be said too about people's first thoughts of if their kid had it, they'll fix them is I think there's this connotation for people like, I don't need fixed. There's nothing wrong with me. I have Tourette's syndrome, but I don't need to be fixed. Would I like to never tick? Yes. But I wouldn't want the people around me thinking that I need to be fixed because I'm not broke. Like my body still does all the other normal things. It just does it in a much weirder way sometimes. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) I definitely relate to that. Yeah. 
I was going to ask you, though, do you ever with your intrusive thoughts, do you ever have intrusive thoughts that like come out as ticks? Like, um, for example, um, I was cooking the other day um, and I had like an intrusive thought to touch the hot pan and my mm. ticks did it. Ugh. So that was really fun. <laughs> I have actually just recently saw that happening to somebody else, too. I don't have it as much i definitely feel that it can happen for me because i can feel that urge start to brew in my body like that premonition that we can sometimes get with our tics but i do think like every once in a while i haven't had it where i burn myself thank god so far knock on wood but i've definitely heard of that happening to so many people and that's like an example that a lot of people use to show people like this isn't just some cute little quirky thing that we can have it can be painful because it makes us do painful things yeah and (laughs) i post so i have my um tourette's awareness account uh on instagram where i post a lot um about like my what's going on with my life i post memes on there i post like regular like uh helpful like posts like what to do if someone's having a tick attack, like ways to help and stuff like that. Like generally that type of stuff on my account. And, um, but I also do like, uh, I have a small series of posts. It's literally two posts, but like, um, where I'll literally post pictures of like my injuries that I've gotten from my Tourette's just to show people like, Hey, this is something that's serious. It causes me pain sometimes. Like it's not just something that's like, it's cute and quirky. And right. Yeah. Yeah, I just realized because I thought I was already following you on Instagram and I just realized that I didn't. So I went to make sure that I was. I apologize about that. I thought <laughs> I, knew I was already following you because I know I've seen your post before and I know I've shared them in my stories before. Oh. <laughs> I didn't notice either, but I thought you were following me too. <laughs> right. Well, now I definitely am for sure. Heck yeah. <laughs> Um, so when, so you have that, so it's it's really nice. You kind of keep, uh, leading me right up to some questions that I want to ask you. So it's, (laughs) this is working out great. You mentioned your Instagram in that you share stuff on there and advocate on there. What led you or made you want to start doing that? Um, okay. So basically I am addicted to Instagram. Okay. I have been since like middle school. Um, And I, when I got my Tourette's diagnosis, um, well, before that, I had a a provisional tick disorder diagnosis. Okay. Um, uh, But like, we didn't really like tell like my school or anything like, hey, I have provisional tick disorder. We just told them I had ticks because they didn't really need to know all that. (laughs) We were waiting for like, uh and a more like official diagnosis because that one's not really like it's like a temporary diagnosis you know yeah so um when I got my provisional tick disorder diagnosis I got curious and I went on Instagram and I was looking at hashtags for like um ticks and Tourette's and all this stuff and I found all these accounts and I was like wow these are like super great like I relate a lot to these and like these are like super helpful they make me feel like I have more of a community they make me feel less alone. And I like, I loved that about that. So I was like, hey, what if I made my own account and I could make other people feel that way? Like, and I've gotten so many DMs from people who have been like, thank you literally just for making your account, like, and just existing because it just makes me feel so much less alone in the world. And it like, it makes me tear up every time. Like, it's so cute. Yeah, I love it so much. Isn't it like one of the best comments that you can get? It's it's the best. I I completely agree. There's always so many times where I'm just like, oh, you just made my day because all the the advocacy work is incredible. And I love it more than anything. I have such a passion for it. But then there's those days, those like really rough days or like where we those days where we feel like we're taking step backwards because there's another joke about it that's made major headlines and that only ever seems to be the thing that makes major headlines for Tourette syndrome and I get yeah. so discouraged. 
But then like a comment or like a DM will come through like that. And I'm reminded, I'm like, no, I'm doing this for a reason because we are making a difference despite still fighting media, like media outlets. Yeah, definitely. What would you say for somebody else? Because I know I've talked to some people, like people who sometimes will message me and say, I really want to start advocating, but I'm really nervous. I don't know what to do. Like I'm scared about doing it. What would some of your advice be to somebody saying something like that to you? I would say, honestly, just go for it because that's exactly what I did. And like, it's honestly been one of the best decisions I've made. Like doing advocacy work um, not only makes me feel really great, but it definitely helps other people. And that's what I love about it so much. Um, So yeah, just, just go for it. Like what's the worst that could go wrong? Like, there's literally nothing that could go wrong. Right. Yeah. And I always, I have to remind myself that there's always, despite what it seems like some days or from other people, there's always more good people out there than the bad ones. Because obviously those negative comments, they come every once in a while and I get them and I still fight through them every once, like to this day. But there's so many more people out there that are either relating to it or learning about Tourette syndrome in that yeah. well outweighs any of the negativity. Yeah, definitely. I think just going for it is the best because I, when I went to start making my YouTube videos, I was terrified. I think I talked about it for a good, at least a year, if not two years saying I was going to do this. I was going to do this. I wanted to create more awareness out there, but I was too afraid. And I finally just did it randomly one day. I don't know what came over me, but I made the video, but I, probably hovered over that post button for probably a good 20 minutes before I just (laughs) shut my computer and went to sleep. (laughs) Well, but it it ended up working out because I didn't want to see it. And I'm surprised I was even able to fall asleep without looking at it again. But I think I was honestly just so afraid of what would happen because it's the first time I was putting like recordings of my ticks out there on the internet, like people seeing me do it and the people that are around me, even like people that I'm around all every, a lot, they don't always see me tick because they're not with me 24 seven. And I am subconsciously suppressing sometimes without realizing it. Yeah. And I just thought all these things are like, they're going to think I'm faking because I don't tick this much when I'm talking to them, but this because I'm talking about my Tourette syndrome and all of these things. And when I woke up the next morning, my husband woke me up the next morning and he was leaving for work. He's like, did you see, he's like, did you get on Facebook yet or and see about your video? And I'm like, Oh no, I don't, I don't think I want to do that. <laughs> <laughs> and he's like you should probably look at it he's like there's a lot of really awesome like people are being really awesome about it and I'm like oh really so I like hopped out of bed and went and looked I'm like man why didn't I do this a long time ago yeah I <laughs> honestly my first post I don't even remember what I posted but I was so beyond nervous um because I was like well what if people, what if I get a bunch of nasty DMs from people who are like, oh, you don't have Tourette's, you're faking. Because there are people like that on the internet. Right. And that's what mainly caused me anxiety about it. But in the end, I was just like, you know what, I'm going to go for it. And we'll just see how it turns out. And I got like a lot of like positive, like feedback. Like I got a lot of likes and like people DMing me and they're like, hey, I like your account. Like, keep up the good work and stuff like that. And I was like, oh my God, this is like actually a good thing that's happening. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it always ends up being better than we think it's going to be in our heads. Yes. I feel like we often like <clears throat> think the worst, you know? Yes, absolutely. Um, especially as people with anxiety, thinking the worst is something I could win a gold medal in. Oh, definitely. <laughs> so I want to go back just a little bit um because we're coming up a little bit on time here because <clears throat> you were talking about your parents and people in school and all of that and I want to make sure I right. ask you so how is like your support system that you lean on your parents your close friends how are they and how do they tend to deal with your tics is it mostly ignoring only asking when you know you're going into those tick attacks. Were they accepting from the beginning or was it a struggle at hey. all to get them to understand? Um, it wasn't really a struggle to get them to understand, surprisingly. Like um, my parents, especially like um, I feel like 
I don't really know what their background with Tourette's is. Um, like if they had friends who have had Tourette's before and that's why they were so like normal with it. Um, I haven't really thought to ask. I might actually later today, <laughs> but um, uh, yeah, they were pretty normal with it at first. They were like, oh, so you think you're having tics? And I'm like, yep. Because I had like looked up what like all the head jerking and like all the little noises and like what all that was about like on Google and like Google was like, yep, these are tics. <laughs> and so I told my parents, I was like, I think I'm having tics. And they're like, oh, okay. And they just kind of accepted it and moved on. Um, and like uh, when something happened that was tick, they were like, was that a tick? And like at first I had to like tell them like, yes, that was a tick. But like now it's kind of like they can tell what is my ticks and what isn't mm -hmm. um, because they're so like used to it. Um, but overall, they've been like super supportive. <clears throat> they do make a couple jokes here and there but you right. know what I for I forgive them because they're my parents <laughs> right yeah um but nothing and nothing hurtful um but uh yeah they're pretty good about it um yeah. I love them very dearly um and I'm sure they will be listening to this episode in the future <laughs> so <laughs> love you mom and dad <laughs> Well, I'm really, really glad to hear that. It's always uplifting to hear because I had very supportive parents as well and still do to this day. And I still call my mom on my bad tick days. I'm 32 years old. I still call my mom crying on my bad tick days. So mm. she will always be that phone call for me. See, and I feel like e even though my parents are a really big support for me, um, the person, if I was, well, I do have like really bad tick days, like a lot of the time, quite often, um, because my Tourette's is pretty severe. Um, mm -hmm. um, but my person will always be my best friend, Jesse. And yeah. he just understands me like nobody else. And like, he doesn't have ticks or anything himself. He's just very understanding. And like, I don't know, that dude gets me. Yeah. <laughs> That's amazing. I love hearing that too. It's always good to have that friend in your life that is that person for you, especially when you have something like Tourette's syndrome. Yeah. And recently I have gotten a wonderful boyfriend who has also been very supportive. Oh, you, that's amazing too. I know that for me, dating with Tourette's syndrome, it was a fear of mine that I wasn't going to have somebody that actually accepted it and didn't just say that he accepted it and later on I figured out that they actually really didn't or couldn't handle it yeah I feel Did like I feel like um I definitely had that too because I was like oh my god literally how will anybody ever love me if I like punch them as a tick like because <laughs> I'll do that to people like if they stand too close to me like I'll punch them like it's it's really bad <laughs> but um I need to get some boxing gloves <laughs> yeah, there but you go. um yeah I, I'll just walk around looking all cool <laughs> but uh I've I have hit him once and he was like completely fine with it he was like no that wasn't even that bad I still love oh, you <laughs> and I was like oh you're so sweet <laughs> well that's really awesome it's oh it's always so nice to have and have realized that those fears that we had once again, just were our minds playing tricks on us. Yeah. So one other question that I have, one of my last questions would be, um, what is there anything that you do outside of school and everything that helps your ticks at all? Is there anything that you can go to that your ticks calm down or kind of disappear? I know a lot of people in the community have something like that. For me, it used to be dance. I never ticked. And now when I exercise, I don't tick as much. I still tick, but it's still a good release for me. Do you have anything like that that you turn to? Yeah. Um, I was going to say uh, piano and drawing are like mm -hmm. my two main things. So piano, I've been playing since like I was like three years old. So wow. really long time. Um, and it's always just been there for me. Like even not because of my ticks. Like if I just need like to like 
I don't even know what the word is, but like vent, but like with music, like the piano is just there for me. So Mm -hmm. it's really good. Um, And it's just something I've always turned to is music. Um, And it calms me down. Like even just listening to music, like calms me down like significantly. So when I'm at school or when I'm in like public places where I know like my ticks might get a little crazy, I always have like my AirPods on me or something. So I can like pop them in and listen to some music and like, just like chill out you know yeah and then drawing um I have also been doing art since I was really really little um and I am a current working artist um I which I'm very happy to say um I have like commissions open and everything so people can like pay me to do work like artwork for them oh that's Um, amazing yeah which is really cool um I've been wanting to do it for a really long time and I finally talked myself into it. So yeah, it's really good. Um, and drawing is just another one of those things where like, I can just kind of like focus on it and like get everything out and not, not focus on what's going on like around me, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So those are like my two like coping skills, I guess. That's awesome. As a person who, as I've told you, I can't draw. I'm always fascinated by people that can. <laughs> One last question before I get to where we can find you on those all of those social media links. What is another advice one, but what advice would you have for somebody else going through Tourette syndrome right now that may be having just a difficult time and maybe even feeling a little alone? Um first things first you're definitely not alone there are there's like a whole community of people like even just on the internet like all you have to do is like search for them and it's like finding your family like your internet family like I have so many support groups like on Instagram that I'm a part of like um if you guys like follow me on Instagram like I'm 100% willing to like talk like anytime about like anything um so like you're definitely not alone and you know what we'll get through this like 100 percent. like Tourette's ain't got nothing on us okay (laughs) I love that perfect advice I would say so with all of that being said where can anybody listening that wants to reach out or find you or find your uh drawings and maybe get a commissioned piece where can they find all of that um basically just through my tick account uh my tick awareness account like I have like my main account linked in the bio there so uh that account is aya.ticks a-i-y-a dot t-i-c-s on instagram and that's where I post like all my awareness stuff and all my ts stuff and it's a really good like outlet for me and uh I make really funny memes. I'm going to say it. (laughs) Um, And then um, my art account is in the bio in for that account. So I'm not going to say the at because it's kind of long, but (laughs) that is fine. All right. Well, yeah, definitely anybody out there watching or listening. (laughs) <laughs> Definitely find Aya on her Instagram account and follow her awareness video and especially her drawing Instagram account as well. And with that, I will go ahead and say goodbye to everyone listening. Thank you so much, Aya, for being here. Thank you for allowing me to be the guest host with you. This has been awesome. And it's been such a pleasure getting to talk to you and learn a little bit about your story. Yeah, thank you for having me. And um, this has been really great. Um, I love to talk Um, like this is like such a great experience and I also wanted to say I literally just finished your book like a couple days ago and it was so good it was so good thank you so much that means so much for me to hear I get I never get tired I don't think I'll ever get tired of hearing that it gives me chills every time I hear somebody say that
Thanks for listening. Thanks to Brittany and Aya. That was fantastic and warm. And I love the part about being an advocate on social media because you could be the reflection someone out there needs to see right now. It's those connections that really do save lives. Brittany uh, Wolf was actually one of the very first people I spoke to uh, on this podcast and was an influence on it for sure. Thanks so much to the both of them for giving us their time. Tourette's podcast is made possible by the Tourette Association of America online at Tourette.org, where you can learn more about Tourette and ways to help the cause, get involved with advocacy, locate knowledge about what Tourette is. You can find a provider, Tourette.org. And you can also find them on YouTube where they have a ton of free webinars and sessions on various topics related to Tourette and tic disorders. They make this show possible, so please tell them thanks for that. Thanks also to Sophia in the UK. Sophia runs the Tourette's Podcast discussion group on Facebook where hundreds and hundreds of listeners share questions and comments, talk about episodes, find community peers and help, and so on. Amazing place, the Tourette's Podcast discussion group on Facebook. And if you're not a member already, when you sign up to join, there are three questions, easy questions you have to answer. That's just our way of weeding out the people who are serious and the people who aren't. We'd like to protect the group. So that's what that's for. So make sure you answer the three questions and we can accept you into the group. And that'll do it for this episode of Tourette's Podcast on the Geeks Rising Network at geeksrising.com, a podcast network looking out for us. Thanks, Bandrew and the gang for everything. And we will talk to you again on the next episode of Season 8, Tourette's Podcast. This is Ben. <laughs>